네, 안녕하세요. 네, 저는 오늘 사회를 맡은 에너지 전환 포럼의 임재민입니다. 어, 제 목소리가 지금 혹시 잘 들어가고 있는지 좀 확인을 하면서 간단한 안내 말씀을 드리려고 합니다. 이제 들어오신 분들이 이제 한국 분들도 계시고 또 해외에서 들어오신 분들도 계십니다. 또 줌을 많이 이제 해보지 않아서 좀 어, 컨트롤 하는데 또 어려움을 가지신 분들도 아마 있으실 것 같습니다. 어, 지금 한국과 또 뉴질랜드에서 같이 이 행사를 진행하고 있기 때문에요. 저희가 동시 통역을 제공하고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 한국어로 들으실 분들은 오른쪽 아래에 언어를 체크를 하시고 한국어로 체크를 하시면 어, 제가 한국에서 한국말로 얘기할 때 한국말로 들으실 수 있고요. 또 오늘 연사이신 소피가 영어로 얘기할 때또 한국말로 들으실 수 있습니다. 또 일부에서는 또 통역보다는 직접적으로 영어로 또 듣기를 원하시는 분들은 영어, 영어로 변경해서 들으시면 됩니다. 어, 제가 제 목소리가 잘 들어가고 있는지 한번 체크하고 싶은데요. 앞에 있는 스태프분들 혹시 목소리가 잘 들어가는지 한번 확인해 봐 주시겠어요? 네, 감사합니다. 어, 목소리가 잘 들어가고 있다고 합니다. 어, 그럼 지금부터 저희 2022년 기후변화 콜로키움 Z세대가 주도하는 새로운 기후정치란 무엇인가? 콜로키움을 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 어, 저희가 오늘 이 콜로키움을 진행하고 있는 공간은요. 유재라는 공간입니다. 삼청동에 있는 유재라는 공간이고 어, 유재라는 이름이 있을 위에 남길 재입니다. 무엇인가를 남겨서 계속해서 새로운 생산이 이루어질 수 있도록 남긴다는 의미입니다. 어, 기후위기도 그렇고 지구 생태 환경도 그렇고 우리가 무엇인가를 남기지 않고 또 지금에 의해서 탐욕에 의해서 다 사용하고 또 뭔가를 활용했기 때문에 이런 문제들이 생긴 것이 아닐까 싶습니다. 어, 그런 의미 있는 공간에서 저희가 함께 October from the production. So I think this place and the name of the place is really meaningful and very relevant to the topic of today's event. I think this is the sixth colloquium, but some of you are still the first to this event. So I'd like to give you the intention of this colloquium first. So this colloquium has been organized by People for Earth and Energy Transition Forum at the Gyeonggi Research Institute. Here in Korea, uh, many events have been there to introduce the policies and activities carried out by companies. We have had that kind of event so far. But to respond better to the climate crisis, instead of just taking the policies we have to change our way of thinking, but it has not been fully discussed here in Korea. So we just think how we can change our approach and way of thinking to respond better to the climate crisis. We want, we believe we need to have some places to have in-depth discussion regarding the topic. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a success event and the Gyeonggi Research Institute has joined us from the fourth colloquium. During the fourth uh, colloquium, we had British professors to talk about how we can make a justice transition to energy economy. Of course, the transition should be speeded up, but we but there are some big issues coming from the fossil fuel. But if we speed up the transition, then it may have some many side effects. So in the process, we have to make a just a practice just a transition. And that can happen not only at the national level, but at the continental level or global level. So we discuss how we can make and achieve that just a transition at the global level. And we have a view that from multiple different perspectives, like a politics and some others. And in the sixth session, we invited a professor from Lund University, Sweden, who is also the author of Under the Sky. And she highlighted how civic groups uh, can work together to respond to the climate crisis, not only based on the scientific data, and we, we can work for the climate crisis with the languages that have been commonly shared by the civic community. So we, during that session, we talk about how we can come up with ideas that is very relevant to the daily lives of the community. And finally, we have the sixth colloquium. 
And we, our invited speaker is Sophie Handford, who is the counselor of New Zealand. And she is very well known for Korean young uh, activists. And here in Korea, just like a global event, we had some this, uh, school strike for climate action. And there were big strike in New Zealand. And Sophie is the main character of that event. So Sophie, would you introduce yourself to Korean audience? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the honor to be with you uh, today. I am so, so privileged to participate in this conversation alongside, alongside all of you and to have this discussion about an issue which puts our collective home and our right to a future as young people at stake. And so it's extremely important uh, that we are all involved and that we're all bringing our different kind of knowledge and understanding and perspective to the table to uh, have hard conversations and to have uh, insightful conversations about the future. Uh, now I am just recovering from COVID-19. I've, I've, I'm just on the end of my isolation period. So if I need to cough uh, a little bit during, during the talk, I will just, I will just do so. Um, so apologies, apologies for that. But I'm, I'm really grateful to be here with you all uh, in this shared space virtually. And yes, excited to get into the discussion. So there is some technical glitches. So we could we didn't hear you really. So Sophie, can you hear me fine? Yes, I can hear you fine. 감사합니다, Sophie. Uh, 네. All right. So we resolved the technical glitches. So you introduce yourself briefly. But we have three discussants for today. And we have three discussants, as you can see. One is an enthusiastic activist named Oh Ji Hyuk, and who is the leader, co-leader of the Youth Climate Emergence Action. And the one next to sitting next to you is Yu Jong Hyun, who is also working for Plan Zero, which is the youth group for the climate. And last but not least, uh, the one who is sitting next to me is Dr. Dong Young Kim, who is working for Gyeonggi Research Institute. And this institute is located and work for the most populous area. We want to this event very casual. So Sophie, you can just talk about the perspective of your movement and what was your motivation to initiate that movement and what kind of challenges or you know, some concerns you are having. So we're gonna give you the 30 minutes to share that thought. And then this discussant will share their concerns and their movement and activities they are doing here in Korea. So we'd like to give the floor to Sophie first. The floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. And hopefully you can hear me a little better now. Can you hear me? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, well, I will I will get started and hopefully you could hear um, hear my introduction. Um, but I just I essentially just said that I'm really grateful and honored to be here alongside all of you in this really important conversation happening across across borders, across nations, uh, and across different perspectives that we hold. So again, thank you so much for the invitation to join this conversation. I am just recovering from COVID-19. So if I um, cough or anything during um, during these remarks or during answers to questions or the discussion, uh, just to let you know that that will be why. So again, thank you for all of your mahi, all of your work, uh, all of your energy, because together we have strength and power and together that's what we uh, ultimately need to make sure that we safeguard this planet for the next generation. So who am I? 
Uh, my name is Sophie, I'm 21 years old and I am a counsellor for uh, my district here in New Zealand. I am a lover of and a protector of our collective home, our planet, and ultimately that is my why. My why is that by the end of my life, I want to be able to say and know that I did everything in my power and used my voice to its full potential to speak up for our planet. We know that in decisions that are being made, whether that's you know, across nations, within nations, within districts, our planet can't speak up at, at any given moment and say, think of me, think of you know, the sustainability of, of this home, think of the next generation, think of the, the birds and the bees and think of the rivers and the oceans. And so it's, it's, it's upon us, it's our responsibility then to bring that voice into places of power so that it's not just profit that we constantly place at the helm of what we value, that we instead value having prosperous places, prosperous spaces and prosperous nature, both for us to enjoy, but also for the next generation. So the need for climate politics to change. I'm sure you're all aware of just how crucial this moment in time really is. But when I think about my journey into climate activism, that's what did it for me. What did it for me and what really got me involved in the wider movement is knowing that this moment in time, if we don't use it, we, what do we have left? That this window of time is quite literally the only window that we have to reduce emissions down to a manageable level to ensure that we don't continue to see these huge increases in temperature which put lives, livelihoods, countries and cultures at stake. So because this moment in time is so crucial we have this golden window of opportunity and that brings with it a huge responsibility. And as I mentioned, I often feel that weight on my shoulders and being the planet's voice and being the voice for our next generation, for the earth, for the nature, for the wildlife that we have the opportunity to share this place with. But it not only brings a responsibility, I think it brings a huge opportunity because it means we can reimagine what a climate just world would look like what a world would look like where we valued our planet, where we made decisions that were not only based off of what was going to be the best for us right now, but that we thought about in 500 years time, how do we want our countries, our nations, our world to look, to feel, and to be? And so right now, and this is probably something that you're aware, we have the highest concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere ever. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is sounding alarms. The science is telling us, and we know that this is the defining moment of climate action, and it needs to be. So with global surface temperatures at an all-time high, as I mentioned, that comes with a huge responsibility, because what that means, it doesn't just mean something scientific. It doesn't just mean that yes, we've got you know, these huge amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. It means that people in the Pacific Islands, for example, Tuvalu and Tokelau, are already facing a crisis of mass proportions. They are already experiencing the sea on their doorsteps knocking. They are already experiencing this fear of having to leave their homelands, their culture, everything behind. And so what we are doing now by continuing to pollute and by continuing to place profit over planet and over people is having real time impacts on people's lives. And it's having real time impacts on how people perceive the future. As a young person, I'm pretty, pretty fearful about what kind of world I'll have to be navigating my adult years through, what kind of world I might have to bring children into what kind of world I will then leave behind. But with that comes real hope. And with that, we see people in the Pacific Islands who I mentioned who are literally on the front lines of the impacts right now, who say, we are not drowning, we are fighting. And we have to learn from those on the front lines. We cannot let 
people drown. These are our, our global citizens. These are people who are just like you and I. And so how is that fair? How is that just that people who have done so little to cause this crisis should be feeling the brunt of the impact when we can do something about it, when everything, all of the solutions are in our own hands right now. So we cannot continue to focus on profit at the expense of the planet. We can have coexistence. We can have an economy that supports the planet and a planet that then in turn supports the economy. Our futures as young people are on the line and we have a huge stake in whether action is taken or not. If we don't see action within this window of time in the next eight years, if we do not halve our emissions, the right, our right to a livable future is further out of reach. And I personally don't see how we can continue to just pedal the status quo. Business as usual is not going to get us out of this mess. It's what's got us into this mess. And so we must do things differently to, to, to remove ourselves from the situation that we're in, that we have all power to get out of if we choose to. So this is when I, I kind of started asking myself the question, and this has been a big challenge for me, asking myself the question, what is it going to take? If we truly opened our hearts and our minds to the realities of people right now on the front lines of rising sea levels, people bearing the brunt of us having the highest concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if we truly opened our hearts and our minds to what young people are feeling, the fear that young people are feeling about the state of our planet, about the continued degradation of our environment, about the continued lack of, of leaders listening to what young people think and what young people's aspirations are, if we were to truly open our hearts and our minds to that, we would be taking transformational action because taking transformational action and reducing emissions is what's going to save us. It's what's going to get us to a place and get us to a future that we will feel proud to pass on because I do not want to pass on a future or a world that I know I've let continue go, to continue to go down the path that we are on now. It is simply not the kind of ancestor that I want to be. So I've been asking myself, when are we going to wake up and when are we going to open our hearts and our minds to the extent of the reality? Because just sitting by, it feels wrong and it is wrong. It's completely unjust to the suffering that people are already experiencing and to the suffering that will continue to happen if we do not do what is in our power and radically transform our systems to be non-reliant on fossil fuels, to be centered around a value of sustainability and of what we're passing on to the next generation and to be truly, truly, truly sustainable and valuing our planet. So that led me to asking the question of myself and of others, what kind of ancestor do I want to be? And what kind of ancestor do you want to be? If we, if we sit in this golden window of opportunity, if we sit on our hands and continue to just let what is happening happen, will we look back and go, we, we should have done something. We should have acted while we had time. We should have realized that we were in the midst of, of a huge crisis of mass sufferings, of mass proportions, and got off our hands and used our hands, came together, collaborated, shared ideas, shared knowledge, and radically transformed the way that we live so that it is sustainable. So how does, how does Generation Zero, how does Gen Z connect in to this? We've talked, I've talked about how, obviously, as young people, we have a huge stake in whether there is action or whether there's not, because ultimately we inherit the future that's being created through decisions made now. And that's part of what led me to wanting to be at the decision-making table, because I also don't think it's just that people who 
um, who don't have the same perspectives get to make all of the decisions about the future that ultimately I and and us as young people will be will be navigating and will be inheriting. So I thought we have to get our voice at the table. Here in New Zealand, we are 20% of our population under 24 years old, but we are 100% of the future. We will be the ones leading Aotearoa New Zealand. You, you young people will be the ones leading Korea into what will be hopefully a not so challenging time, but only if we take the action required now to reduce emissions. So we have a really strong connection to the issue because of how much we have at stake. I've also seen through my activism that young people have a really blue sky, creative and collaborative way of thinking and working. We bring optimism and energy. We bring a strong drive for agile systems which can transformationally tackle this challenge in our midst. We aren't ones for continuing the way things have always been done if it doesn't work. Because ultimately, yeah, the same systems that have gotten us into this mess are not going to be the ones that get us out. So we need to have different ways of thinking, different perspectives and different lived experience at the table. So, we are mobilizing, we are raising our voices, and we are getting to and challenging the table. And this is what brings me so much hope, because sometimes it can feel quite paralyzing, understanding that this is a crisis affecting our globe. It's a crisis that some countries are contributing more to than others. It's a country that has, has real justice intersections with it. And it's a crisis that can sometimes make you feel so small it's a crisis which we know there is so much at stake to, because if we don't take action, we risk, you know, not only losing our economy, losing our people, losing, we risk losing the entire planet that all of those things exist on. All of those things rely on us having a planet as a foundation to even have an economy, to have politics, to have all of these other things. So it's time we recognize that. But what the youth movement has really shown me is that there is hope and there is possibility to envision something better. And all it's gonna take is us putting those ideas out there, having discussions about them and finding common ground, finding a way forward through, through what feels like, you know, a really challenging time when actually it doesn't have to be. It just has to be one where we come together based on shared values of wanting to be the best possible ancestors, wanting to do what we can to be, to be good custodians of this planet because it's not ours. We are quite literally just borrowing it from the generation before us uh, and we will then pass it on to the generation that follows. Hopefully you can still hear me. I can't see your video anymore, so. Um. Oh, are we good? I'll just, I'll carry on, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully we're okay. Oh, cool, there we go. So we will continue to do this. We will continue to raise our voice. We will continue to mobilize young people in the thousands and the millions worldwide, because it's simply not good enough that our right to a future continues to be put at the kind of last level of priority and that we, we continue to somehow not see that if we don't have a planet, that all of these other things cannot even, cannot even exist, cannot even be furthered. So we will continue, we will continue to mobilize. I will continue to mobilize and I will continue to get so much hope from the fact that there is, there's a better, a better way of doing things out there. There's a better world possible. Uh, and yeah, it's just gonna take all of us coming to the table and, and all of us contributing what we can to that conversation. So I see that Gen Z are changing climate politics because climate politics are changing us. I never saw myself becoming a climate activist, but I now feel like I kind of have to be because again, if those of us in this moment in time are not doing all that we can, then I've said it enough times, but what kind of ancestors will we be? And so 
we are changing climate politics because climate politics has got us all involved by us truly understanding the impact that inaction and a failure to reduce emissions will have on our, on our lives and on our right to a future. We have no other option and have plentiful opportunities to create a future that we will feel proud of and safe in. So I and we as young people in New Zealand and I'm sure in Korea too, are choosing to be on the right side of history. We are choosing to stand up against continued exploration and extraction of fossil fuels, continued investment into industries that pollute our planet, because we recognize that it's simply not good enough a game to not value our planet in these conversations. So <clears throat> another side of, of kind of my activism, I guess, is um, now in sitting around the council table here in New Zealand. So I ran for my local council and was elected at the age of 18 years of age. Uh, and this was a, a crazy experience too, because just as we had been campaigning really hard across New Zealand for climate justice and for a zero carbon act that um, legislated 1.5 degrees in the act itself and set a really ambitious pathway to being carbon neutral by 2040 was our goal but sadly the government has gone with 2050 um, but as we were doing that as we were engaging with our parliament and I was engaging with my local council I had this realization that it was the first year that I was going to be able to vote and my friends and I weren't sure who we were going to vote for or, um, or how we wanted to try and influence the discussion around our local council table. And one of my friends just said to me, well, you run, you should just try, you should just put your hat in the ring and, and see how it goes. And so I decided that ultimately, again, my why is that by the end of my life, I want to be able to say and know I did everything in my power and use my voice to its full potential to speak up for our planet. Our planet cannot speak up for itself. And so that was the moment when I thought getting around the council table is one way that I can fulfill that responsibility I know I have. And that is a huge opportunity to then raise the voices of other young people with similar fears, but also hopes for the future. And so I ran and I was elected at the age of 18. And what I've realized is that local government and acting local, starting small, can have huge influence. We don't often kind of see it or think it. <coughs> but, you know, small ripples can, can create huge waves. I never, ever could have imagined that I would be here alongside you and we would be having this you know, transnational conversation across borders about an issue which is affecting both of our nations, but also that both of our nations can do huge things about. And so that's what brings me so much hope, but it's something that I never, ever thought just through taking a small action of getting interested in, in climate justice and action on climate change, because I know how much young people will be affected by this and how important our planet is, I never thought that just by being curious and following that and bringing people together around a similar kind of idea and understanding that it would allow us to connect and it would allow these conversations to flow uh, and continue to be developed upon. So it's taught me that, yeah, taking any form of action is a positive step in the right direction. I was asked when I ran for council, you know, what, why, why I saw myself getting involved in local government when, you know, in the scheme of things, local councils are pretty small and um, some people claim that they have a small influence. But what I've, and, and what I said in response to that was any step forward is a good step forward. We cannot afford to stay in the same spot and we cannot afford to take steps backwards. So any little thing that we can do right now that has a direct influence on emissions and a direct influence, a direct influence on uh, the, the level to which we value our planet is positive. And so I thought, yep, I'm going to do it. And yep, I did it. And 
And I realized again that, yeah, local government and starting small, starting those ripples can, can have a huge influence. The other thing I've realized though, which has been slightly challenging in the process is that often these systems and structures are just not designed to, to, to have voices like mine and, and voices like, like that of our indigenous community here in Aotearoa, um, like that of, of our disability Fano, our disabled Fano, and our disabled family, and people who, who might not have kind of a, a traditional law or, um, or standard view or a standard perspective or standard lived experience. But in that, there is so much strength in, in getting in there and trying to change that. Because ultimately, if our systems don't value people, young people, if our systems don't value people who are disabled, if our systems don't value our indigenous communities, if our systems do not value those who are likely to feel the effects of climate change more worse, worsely than the rest of our population, then how are we going to create climate justice? How are we going to center what is just? And so we need to get around those tables and we need to change the way that those tables work because our systems will need to change if we are to, to fully tackle the crisis at hand. And in New Zealand, that looks like addressing colonization. It looks like truly handing over leadership and, and creating partnerships where possible with our indigenous community, Maori people here in New Zealand. It looks like taking that extremely seriously too through how we work alongside young people and how our youth voices are heard, not only as a token or a tick box down at the bottom of the process, actually are up there alongside our decision makers and so again and I stress this point because it I believe it emphasizes uh, what I'm well, the point I'm trying to make here too about you know how these systems can be agile and and ambitious and adaptable is completely rethinking who is at the table and why and that to me looks like thinking about the purpose of why and what we are doing. We cannot, again, we cannot continue to do the same things that we have always done because that will not allow us to solve the climate crisis. Those things that we have always done are the things that have gotten us into this crisis we're in the midst of. They're the very things that we are trying to change. And so our systems must change with that. Our systems must involve different people who have differing lived experiences at the core. If I go back to one of the questions that I'm constantly asking myself and that I find to be a huge challenge, what's it going to take? I mentioned that there are people on the front lines now. I mentioned that young people are fearful. I mentioned that here in New Zealand, we are already seeing, seeing the impact and we're seeing young people band together. So are you, you're seeing young people and you yourselves are banding together. To, to stand up against this degradation and destruction of our planet. And I also mentioned that any little positive step that we are able to take in the plight to reduce our emissions is positive. So what is it going to take? I wind back at that point. What is it going to take for us to recognize this truly as a crisis and take actions that we would as if we were in a crisis. Why are we not acting as if the house is on fire? Because it truly is. Why are we not truly grasping the fact that there are lives and livelihoods at stake right now? If we were to do that, and, we, and if we were to continue to sit by and let this happen and to let ourselves continue in this direction, I don't think we can say that we would have been good ancestors. I don't know what we'll tell ourselves in the future, but this, this is the moment to be courageous. This is the moment to, to, not let, to not let things get in the way of us doing what we need to do, of us truly valuing the planet, valuing the next generation, and just getting in there and getting this done. Getting this done because we have such a crucial window of opportunity 
And that opportunity comes with huge responsibility. And we should all feel that as, as collective citizens, as people who, who reap the benefits of being on this planet, we have each a responsibility. Now, there have been many other challenges I feel like I could have talked about, but also many other things that bring me hope. I hope the message that you can take away from, from this conversation and from uh, what I feel like I've come here to share with you today is that, yes, the crisis is here and now. Yes, the reality is tough. And yes, it is going to have an impact on future generations. But also, yes, we have the solutions here and now. Yes, there are things that you and I can do. And yes, we can do that, these things now. Yes, we don't just need to sit by and let this happen. Let sea level continue to rise and, and let us watch the next generation of young people feel, feel really fearful about, this, about the state of our earth. We don't need to let that happen. Yes, we can do this now. Yes, we have the solutions in our own hands. We just need the courage. We just need to step forward and do what needs to be done. It's going to be tough, sure, but it's also going to be amazing because we will start to see some of those benefits. We will start to see a greener, cleaner, more sustainable, more equitable world within our lifetimes. And that's something I want to see. That's something I want to be a part of. That's something that excites me. It's something that brings me hope. It's something that, that should unite us all together. It's something that should, that should truly, yeah, allow us to see the impact we can have collectively. And I truly believe in that, the impact of, of collectivity and, and us, us banding together and, and just getting this done. So thank you so much again for having me and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Sophie. And as I am very encouraged and, you know, by listening to your lecture. So I think we are on the same page. So I feel very good and I am enthusiastic by your the comment. As a youth, we have some goals about the net zero here in Korea. And I was one of the person who discussed about the net zero in 2019. Back then, we didn't talk a lot about the net zero, but we used, suggested, insisted on that. We are not anymore developing country. We are the best country. And we have to show the examples to the world by setting out our goal to the net zero. And the one of the most comments that I'm having was that it's impossible we, this is not the right time for Korea to suggest the yeah. So I was devastated and I was angry back then. I fight it, argue seriously and aggressively against that. And one thing I heard from that discussion is that I don't know what future will be in 2050. And I don't know, I, ca I, I cannot imagine what the future will be. And some people, even say that in that discussion. While listening to that, I was furious about that. And he says it's impossible, but he's not interested in what future will be, but still he has a seat in the discussion table, but his decision will have a big effect on the next generation, but there was not many youths who are on that discussion table. But at the same time, there were some other youth leaders so some of the youth leaders who were in the table might have some questions in the year of 2050, then the people may say that, what did you do at the table when they discussed about net zero? If I just say, I didn't have any authority and right to make a decision, then that's just the rain excuse. And I think we there are many rooms still for us to find and to improve better. And while listening to you, you also highlight that the system should change and we have to bring about new way of thinking for the plant that we want to live in. I totally agree with that. And 
I just to focus on what I can do uh, depending on, uh, you know, the limited to my age. So I think we have to expand our, our the horizon and perspective to come up with many more different ideas to achieve net zero and to make a better places. So we have many youth here who are having clear understanding for the future. So why don't we start with Mr. O? Why don't you share your activity that you are working and what is your goal? And if you have any questions to Sophie, then feel free to ask any question. And Sophie also, while listening to our Korean youth leaders, you can just ask some questions if you have any. So Jiok O, would you make some comment? Can you hear me clearly? Okay. I think everybody can clear me loud and clear. So as introduced, I am co-founder and representative of YCEA. And from 2019, I have been in the politics as well. I am always interested in politics. And since after I get involved and interested in the economy, that economy environment, and I want to find the link between the politics and environment. And the youth leaders argue that we need to do some individual activities like walking instead of taking some ride and using some tumbler instead of using paper cup. I don't think that's enough. So these days, you know, just to, if we are just saying we need to take some individual action at the individual level, that's very uh, oblivious to the situation that we are having. We That means we have to find some solutions, what the tangible action we have to take to respond better to the climate crisis that we are having. So today, June 1st, very soon, we have a regional election. And so we can just look out what result we can expect from that election. And we are not only uh, the electing some the regional representatives, including the superintendent. And as a result of that election, eight thousands of political leaders will be decided. And actually in the previous election, uh, the Democratic Party win the election in a big way. But this time, uh, the, uh, the ruling party today and the opposition party of the previous election seems more powerful, seems more, you know, the positive to win in a big way. That means is that the people are not happy with the activities and the, some the political campaign suggested by the diplomatic party. That means many uh, the seats for the, you know, the, uh, the small opposition parties will be limited this time. So the progressive parties seat will be limited. That's one of the expectation for this result. And the progressive parties are very, are getting, losing their power. So we have to consider how we can support them if they are having the right political uh, the, the campaign. Then against this backdrop, we have to think about what kind of uh, direction the progressive party should have. So when we achieved the democratization in Korea, it was a transformation here. And we need such a transformation now in this country. So in New Zealand, you rallied 17,000 people in New Zealand. However, now you are a district councillor. So although we have many supporters, it is another story to have a political power in a certain issue and it takes a time and it is a big challenge. And this issue in this challenge is palpable now. So in 
and among intellectuals, we shouldn't stop at announcing that climate action is required. We have to fill it ourselves. We have to reduce parking spots and we need more green land. And to respond to climate crisis, we have uh, many detailed requirements and we have to present uh, such a detailed requirement to solve the current issue. Then we need a different political landscape to achieve this. And there is a lack of a message for the use because now a limited number of youth activist, activists are working on the issue and it is covered by a small number of media. So it is a small dream for a limited number of youth in Korea. So to have a better system and to achieve a bigger transformation, we need to rally more use. So maybe I have to give a chance to another speaker. So I want a more interactive session. That's why I stopped you. Okay, got it. So instead of having a unilateral uh, presentation, I wanted something more interactive. But if you have more to say, uh, you can continue. And afterward, we can have a better uh, interaction. I'm sorry to stop you in the middle of the presentation. You can continue. So at the end of the day, right now, so when we talk about regional politics and climate action, we need more people elected through campaigns on environment. And parties with green policy should have more seats in the National Assembly. And we have to think about how we can achieve this. And especially climate activists should think about how to expand their power in the political system. And climate campaign should lead to the revival of a progressive parties in Korea. So when we look back on the past activities, Many parties talked about political neutrality when they consider uh, environmental issues. However, there were some aggressive activities by NGOs. And sometimes NGOs side with the parties which were against their campaigns before. So I know that individuals give in-depth thought to the issue, but we have a vicious cycle in Korea in terms of politics. So civic organizations do not successfully organize themselves and they always call out political neutrality, but in terms of action, they side with a certain political party. So. They say political neutrality, but they do not act on political neutrality. It is very strange. And we have to stop the privatization of a public movement. And I think that is the role of the youth in Korea. We shouldn't compromise. And we have to think of a more stronger campaign. So if we continue what we have done for the past three decades, nothing will change. We didn't legislate anything and politics has never changed in Korea. So we have to change the political system to achieve our goals. Thank you very much. 
So I wanted to say rather than presentation. And sorry to interrupt you once again. So he talked about activists who entered the politics, however, they compromised a lot after entering politics. So he is disappointed. And just entering politics doesn't make a lot of changes. So we need a better environment for more youth to participate in bigger movements. That was his message. And now we will move on to Ms. Yu Jung Hyun. So uh, let's have interaction instead of a presentation. Is that okay? Yes. Hello. I'm working for Big Wave. And I also work for a group called Plan Zero. And my name is Yu Jung Hyun. So I call myself climate activist, but I started last year, which is very recent. And I had a clear motivation last year because in Korea, carbon neutrality 2050 scenario was built. So Korea organized the Carbon Neutrality Commission and they decided to listen to the youth and they elected some of the youth members for the council and they built a cooperative body for the youth. So there was a chance for the youth to participate in the discussion. But not only me, there have been activists who have been working on the issue for a long time. And we thought about how to raise a common voice as a young generation in Korea. And activists who have been working on the issue for a long time, they said they suggested building the worst case scenario. And Activists from different groups build scenarios together. And our target deadline was 2040 instead of 2050. And based on the scenario, we raised a common voice. And the Carbon Neutrality Committee is an official group. So I wanted to tap into that position to do something more. So here was the chairman of the commission. And I wanted to deliver, deliver the voice of the youth to the chairman. So I wrote a letter to him. And I worked for the council and I listened to other activists, other youth activists. And there is a strong opposition from the commercial industries in Korea. And now it is very important for the industry to take action on the cl climate front. So I wrote a letter to the Ministry of Trade and Industry of Korea, and it was covered in the media. So I wrote a letter personally. However, the minister and the chairman of the commission wanted to listen to the voice of the youth. So they met my colleagues and me. So what I felt back then, so just meeting the minister and the chairman doesn't guarantee a huge impact and it doesn't generate a huge impact right away. However, 
at least I felt that no matter how hard it is to reflect our voice, and no matter how minimal the impact is right now, we have to do everything in our power. We still have to make efforts. And in Korea, uh, we say that uh, sometimes, uh, although uh, it looks impossible, however, if we continue to do so, we can accumulate know-how in the process at least. That is why uh, we need to have this kind of a mindset. We have to continue to explore solutions when we do any when we take any climate action. And Sophie, you are a district councillor. And youth activists and climate activists, are they entering politics? And, and I think it is important to see those kinds of activities in Korea, whether it is politics, whether it is climate, I hope more and more youth will be interested in those issues. Thank you very much. So she shared her personal experiences. Sophie, you might uh, have questions about the comments yourself. And, and Ms. Hyun here talked to the lawmakers and the minister and the chairman of the committee, and she wrote the letters. And she, was, she uh, sounds frustrated a little bit because she was disappointed be because there was no impact even after meeting them. And she uh, used the expression of throwing uh, stones, stones against the wind. But uh, rallying people who have who share the same interest is in is hard as well. I believe that Sophie, you must have similar experiences, and you must have thought about this issue in the process a lot. And Sophie, you can ask the questions if you uh, would, if you have some. That's a better yeah, way I would to love, proceed. Yeah, I would, thank you. Yeah, I would love to ask some questions and just, just thank both of you for sharing your stories and experiences. And something that came through quite strongly was kind of the, the political landscape in which you're working in Korea and in which you're trying to mobilize change and achieve change at a... Um, kind of leadership level, whether that's district district wide or whether that's uh, across across the nation. Um, but ultimately, I wonder I wonder if either of you have any thoughts on how we try and remove the politics from this discussion because ultimately it, it's I don't think it's a conversation about which political side or party or or standing we might have. But it's it's a conversation that, regardless of your political colors, you know, is is something that we should all be participating in, and all feel like we have a responsibility to contribute to, and all feel like we have a responsibility to do something about. So, I wonder if if either of you have had any thoughts about how we try and, or how you might. Obviously, this is challenging within the the landscape that you're in, um, and it's challenging here too. But I wonder if that's a question that you've thought about is how to, um, yeah, how to try and speak across political divide um, and also, also how to rally not just young people, but make the movement even wider and bigger to encompass adults and, and elderly. And that's what we've tried to do here. So I wonder if you've, if you've thought about that as well. Okay, so I think they can add up at the build up on your question and me Jihan or Mr. Oh, do you have a similar experiences that Sophie mentioned? Who gonna start first? All right, I, I will start first. I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly. So let me just repeat the question. Instead of working with the political uh, power, have you ever tried to resolve this issue with the general citizens 
and that doesn't need to be used, but you can just do work or dialogue with some other generations and other civic group to resolve this issue without the political power. I'm not sure if it is a right word to say exclude the politics, because our action itself should be political. And we have to have a certain strategies and certain tactics to have certain results. And in the process, well, we can say that we can work with this political party only. I think we have to be flexible to work with any political party. For example, you know, we of course we have to keep distance from politics because certain party can be in power later on. And if that candidate or the political figure who used to work with us can be our, the leader of the greater political landscape, if that's the case, we should be able to criticize him or her. But the uh, getting involved in the politics and making uh, some voices in the political landscape should be done. We shouldn't be fearful of that anymore. And the NGOs or some other youth groups have been uh, have been used to, to be dreadful and fearful to make up political voices. But I think we have to go over that obstacles. And Mi Ji-hyun, you have been involved in the political side and political landscape before. So would you share your experience? Yes. First of all, I think I really appreciate your question because Korean political landscape is not that positive and favorable. And I understand the political system of New Zealand are totally different from the Korea. You know, in Korea, it's more challenging for youth to be involved in the politics. I think that that is the same for many other countries. So I have a lot of concerns for the political institutions and system here in Korea. But you ask about how we can do this work without the power of politics. And you just to say that, have you have we ever think about how we can carry out this activism or the movement with the general public? So it's a kind of an aha moment for me because, you know, it's important to, to get involved in the politics, but we can still have some other ways to achieve our goal. Uh, personally, I love culture and drawings. I sometimes draw paintings and I really want to do some draw some tune. And I actually draw some kind of my daily life into some the comics. And I have some like-minded people. So we share some thoughts how we can develop that uh, the cartoons. So we haven't started yet, but to maybe we will do that soon. And I we I have another idea. I just, my idea is that we can develop some the tourism product. And my colleagues say that out of many tourist spots here in Korea, some are related to the climate crisis, and some are. You know, the one of the key strategies for the climate crisis is energy transition. So some of the tourist spots can be related to the energy transition. So we can develop very interesting tourist package program. And uh, the general public who are not that much known about the environmental issue can realize many things by taking part in that package program. I think that's really a creative and a new idea. Um, so there are so many ways we can achieve this goal without politics. Thank you. So I think the questions are well delivered and I think they give quite a good answer to your questions. So we can just to give more time for you to ask a question. So we have one more discussion to who is sitting next to me, Dr. Dong Young Kim. You can just make a comment. Uh, to the other opinions of some discussant and the presenter, or you can ask a question. I am an older generation. I think I am the oldest person sitting here. You know, you may don't know about the five, eight, six generation. Uh, those who are born in the 50s 
and uh, they graduated college in the 80s and currently in their 60s. So that's the generation of old and that's the generation of five, six, eight here in Korea. Because today's topic is about the climate or use and use climate. So I had a lot of thoughts. I have not been involved with the use that much. So I have great concern and I still have some concern what I should talk to you. And, but as I listened to your comment and many discussions and the comment from the you know MC, it reminds me of the energy and enthusiasm of use. And I can also even think about the concerns and concerns that I used to have during my use. I had a lot of dreams and that I am reminded of that dreams after a while. And I feel relieved to see your enthusiasm. And I just think about the gap between the generation and I believe we can overcome that gap. As I introduced, I am working for Gyeonggi Research Institute. This is a really unique model here in Korea. My institute is studying policy in Korea. Many, there are many policy study institute and the policy institute have been owned by central government and local government and even a specific political party. So I think that there are 40 to 50 different policy institutes in total and they are working in the government and the civic group or the general citizens. Uh, so they are uh, making some professional analysis and uh, between the two. So this is very unique model and the, this is one of the strengths that Korea has. So at the research center, I am responsible for climate and ecology for 20 to 30 years. So in that time, during that time, I have been experienced how climate and ecology issues have been discussed and resolved and spread across the society. And even I saw that how that have been institutionalized and what kind of decision have been made after our policy study and how the policy have been implemented. And I even saw what was inefficient and what was working well. So during the past 20 to 30 years, if you look at the air pollution and environmental pollution area, we have made a lot of progress, to be honest with you. Actually, that progress is not enough and we have been very slow to make that progress. So it was controversial, but I don't want to give you every detail, but I just to give you what I feel about the current situation. I think we have commonalities. Very recently, there are many narratives related to the climate change and climate issue, not only here in Korea, but also globally. And Korea enhanced NDC and come up with a net zero scenario. And many of them are same. In perspective, it is suppliers oriented perspective and they never gave up growth and they have technology, technology can do everything approach. We can achieve natural while we are doing everything we want. We can achieve climate issue result while we Im improve our living standard and welfare and well-being. But according to our research analysis, that's greedy, greed, and that cannot that greed cannot be fulfilled. In the process of a growing economy, as a consequence, we have air quality issue and the environmental pollution issue. But we can just keep having that issue unattended. But we can also a growth economy and we can resolve the climate issue. I think that's irony and that's not right. As Sophie mentioned, we have to change our the living, way of living. And we also have to make a, a balance between supply and demand. 
So we have to think about how we can achieve that. There are many policies in the climate. There are roughly, uh, roughly speaking, there are 50 different major climate policies. There are so many reasons we cannot achieve the goals we have set, but still we can overcome such difficulties and over uh, the obstacles to achieve that. There is a many ways for us to achieve that goals. That's one point. And all the audiences sitting here can come up with some tangible ways to implement such goals that you can involve in the process more actively. So I think that is the right way for the future of everyone. So to sum it up, in the political scene, to be specifically from the policy scene, the voices of youth have not heard that much. I feel very sorry for that. I haven't heard a lot of youth voices yet. And I sincerely wish your voice will be louder and spread across the country and globe, and your voice should be translated into policies. And we have to support your voices will be implemented, then we can have a real, uh, the specific future that we are dreaming of. So that's the second point I'd like to highlight. This is not the generational issue, but the future for all. So we have to uh, collect our wisdom together. And I hope we have more opportunities like today. Thank you very much to share many good comments. And I think that some of your comment is related to the question that we have received before this event. One youth activist left a question like that. Here in Korea, the energy accessibility is pretty low and many are having difficulties. So some are saying that we should achieve economic growth. And because there are so many financially vulnerable, to help them, we have to make economic growth. And how we can persuade them. So what is your kind of the arguments or the statement to, to persuade them. And the second question is that, as Dr. Kim said that, many are saying that we have to respond to and act out for the climate crisis. But when it comes to the action, we have to more think about how we can act it out, not just to talk the talk. We have to have some specific uh, the goals and specific ways to implement and act out the our the targets. So you had some activities and act the movement with your friends, and then you just to join the political scene. So your concern between the two different periods might be different. So you can share your uh, your experience, and you can also feel free to ask any some additional question to the discussant. Wow, thank you. Those are very interesting questions. And they are both ones that I've come up against in, in my role now in politics, whether we can have economic growth and also growth of our population while also having regard and respect for the planet and whether we, um, yeah, whether economic growth has to come at the expense of our planet. I think we can have green economic growth. Economic growth can be positive if it's channeled into the right things like for example sustainable and, and zero emissions forms of energy um, solar wind generation hydro generation all of those different opportunities geothermal generation economic growth we can capitalize on those opportunities and yes we have the technology available to us now but a lot of the technology that we will need and that that can be put into action now isn't aren't things that we need to necessarily wait on innovation to have. And so I think economic growth doesn't have to look like continued investment into industries that, that are polluting our planet. They can be, you know, diversifying our economy so that in the long run, we are better off. Because ultimately, if we continue seeing economic growth as just investment in these industries that are not doing our planet 
any good, then when it comes to the point that our climate is completely broken down and isn't sustaining life on earth, then we will need to, to transition the way we look at economic growth anyway. So if we do it now, it's just going to be a whole lot easier, more cost effective, less intensive on the economy, and actually we can bring people along with us. So I would say, I would say yes, as you've mentioned, economic growth to, to a point is, is important in ensuring that you know, our people have everything they need, but we can't measure just profit from that. We have to measure how healthy our planet is, how healthy our people are, how happy our people are. We cannot just use an index of, yeah, of continued kind of money growth. Economic growth can be positive if we're, if, again, if we're growing industries and things that have those intersectional benefits, which was talked about, and that when we take climate action, we can focus on people's well-being. And we can focus on air quality and those positive things that come with walking more, cycling more, getting around on public transport, building communities that are closer together and more socially connected uh, and connected in the forms of, of the ways that they get around. So I would say economic growth is, uh, as a term, it's, it's, it can be a little bit, um, a little bit challenging to to understand how it fits in with, with climate justice. And the way that we think about economic growth has to completely shift. When it comes to, to the action, instead of just you know, talking the talk, we need to walk the walk. I think as well, targets are really important. And that means that developed countries need to fully take ownership for and responsibility for their emissions. And so it doesn't mean doing the bare minimum. It means being aspirational. It means, you know, thinking, thinking above and beyond just what we need to do to, to meet, say, our, our um, agreements within, you know, the Paris, Paris targets and the like. It means also having clear accountability measures because it's no good setting a target and then not having any form of accountability, um, accountability back to that and specific kind of levels to which emissions need to be reduced by certain years. I think one thing I've noticed by being in this role now is I really value having people on the outside, having activists who, who are able to hold me accountable. It helps me. It provides me with more of a mandate because sometimes when I'm sitting around the council table, it's obvious that people aren't of the same mind. But what really helps is when not only young people, but across the generations show up and say exactly what I need them to say to be able to push something over the line. And so we don't need all young people or all environmentally minded people in politics because we need to have some on the outside too to do the jobs that, that many of you are doing and being activists. It's an extremely important role. Uh, and we... There is what I've realized too is that there is power in politics, but actually the power is with the people because we will not have the political uh, capital or the political kind of mandate to make a decision unless the people show us that it's that it's what they want us to do. And so there is a lot of power in mobilization and in people making their point really loud and clear and continuing to repeat the same point even if you don't feel like you are being listened and I hear that to a degree where you know you're trying to make your voice heard and there are points where you're coming unstuck or feeling like you're not being listened to and a question that I would maybe put back onto onto the discussants if that's okay is what do you think would need to change about the political landscape to make for a more inclusive environment for young people to bring our environmental concerns and our climate, our climate solutions to the table. And also as, as a kind of, if, if that question doesn't really make that much sense, I would frame it as how do we get, how do you think we can get more adults recognizing and bringing our voices to the table to create space, to create a wedge for us as young people to then take up more space in the conversation because ultimately I do think that we have the most at stake when it comes to this 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 discussion 
we also have many of the solutions and ways of thinking that I think are desperately needed. So yeah, are there ways that the, the world can support you in, in those plights to uh, ensuring that the political landscape is inclusive for young people? And how do we get more adults recognizing that too and bringing our voices to the table to create that space for us when it, uh, when it is properly re there and ready? I hope that makes sense. Thank you for the comment. You also asked the question, but which is a very tricky question for us to answer. It was briefly mentioned that in the Korean politics, it is hard for the youth to participate in politics in Korea. We keep saying that it is important to have youth in politics. However, when we try to participate in politics, and when they, they want to raise their voice in the political scene, it is not simply accepted by the older generation. And how can we make a more inclusive environment for the youth? And do you have any ideas? Ms. Hyun, uh, do you have any ideas? I also have the I want to also ask the same question. We cannot, we cannot uh, clearly distinguish the older generation and the younger generation. However, most of the decision makers belong to the old generation. They are mature enough. So how can we change their mindset? That is the question I asked myself. And in uh, people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, I think they could be impacted by climate crisis themselves because it is an imminent issue. We have to maintain the temperature increase within 1.5 degrees Celsius, but it will, although we make our best efforts, it will go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius at any point. And although we succeed on that target, there will be a more and more impact of climate change in the future. And climate related issues will be present anyway. And these days, honestly, we have a longer lifespan. So people in their 50s and 60s, they will be hugely impacted by climate change. So climate crisis is not only for the younger generation because the older generation will be impacted, to be honest. They have much social influence today, but they will be impacted by climate crisis themselves. But I wonder whether they are not fully aware of the seriousness of the issue. So they have social status, status and they have a fixed mindset to some degree. So how can we persuade them? And we have a, a panelist from Gyeonggi Research Institute. So I want to ask you the same question. So your colleagues, they have a certain social status and they belong to the older generation. And how can we change their mind on this issue? Can I ask for your idea? And Dr. Kim Dong-young is here to answer. And our organizer and the host, the Professor An can answer the question as well because he's the professor of politics. So he can talk about the potential landscape we can create and he can give us a fresh perspective as well. So we can hear from Dr. Kim first. So I think Professor An can give you a better answer, however, I also feel the same way on that point. In environment, uh, environmental issues, I work in that field myself. However, talking to various people, we talk about how important the environmental protection is, and we talk about the future. However, I feel the same barrier among my colleagues. 
the sense of a crisis is the same for me. We have different values in society. It is not only the generational gap, but there are different values people uphold on their own. So we have to overcome the barrier. We keep, we have to keep working on the issue and we have to keep presenting the vision to people. That's what we have to do. And looking back on the past, about 20 years ago, the topic was different from today. Topic of discussion was different. And although it is not satisf satisfactory today, there was, there has been a progress on the environmental side. So political sides have impacted on the discussion. However, in the past, it was not a national policy at all to protect the environment. However, now it is included in national projects. So it is a slow progress. However, it is better today, at least. However, to achieve a faster progress, we need to organize this kind of colloquium more, and we need to rally more youth, more young people in the activities. That's a slow progress, but that's a way uh, to achieve the goal for sure. And uh, can we listen to the listen to the professor now? And the host suddenly asked for answer from me. So I'm not ready, but the host has all the right to do that. So I accept it. I'm in my 50s. So the sentiment could be different from gen, generation M and Z. So I'm not uh, as conscious as you. However, still, especially after COVID-19, I feel more connected to the issue. There is no separate issue for Korea. It is a worldwide issue and we are all connected. And if we can remind ourselves of the connection, I think we have a possibility. So Sophie, do you like BTS music? I'm not so sure. So I'm a huge fan of BTS myself, and there is a song titled Microcosmos. And the song Microcosmos has the message that all individuals are precious. And if we can share this idea, we have the future and we have a possibility. And can I ask one question? I respect the model New Zealand built, so about uh, Maori people. So I am heavily interested in New Zealand. Hanganui River, do you have the uh, river called Hanganui? And Maori people represent the river. So they work as a representative of the river and you have the legislation for that. So I think it is a textbook example for the future. So not only Hanganui River. So in the political system of New Zealand, so you uh, value river and nature and the future generation who is not born at all yet. So uh, when you uh, make a conversion, so when will you uh, make such a big uh, transformation into the new political system? It will be lead. Uh, it will be led by you, I think. And when do you think you uh, will achieve such a transformation in the future? So, Sophie, can you answer the question? Yeah, sure. And that's a great example. The, the Wanganui River has legal rights. And so uh, that is a very strong method of accountability in that if anything is happening to the river that is uh, causing it to, causing those rights to be obstructed or 
um, to, yeah, to, to not be able to be exercised, we can actually, people can step in and, um, and hold, hold polluters to account in that, in that regard. So it is, a, it is an important model. And I would say that we are, we are getting there in terms of a model for both young people and Maori people, our indigenous people to be in the process and not just having to be on the outside, but having the opportunity to sit around the table and contribute to these discussions. And we are finding ways to value nature and value the environment um, but I still think even New Zealand has a way to go in truly walking the talk. We talked about that earlier, you know, encouraging, uh, not just encouraging, but building, building really strong accountability measures for our leaders to not just talk the talk. And I think sometimes uh, New Zealand is, is kind of coined or portrayed as a really clean green nation. And we have some, some initiatives for sure that are, are getting us in that way. We are exploring more sustainable ways of producing meat and dairy, which New Zealand is quite famous for. Um, we are exploring, you know, different ways to, to transport ourselves around the country. We are investing in, uh, in various forms of other, other types of energy, for example, hydrogen. And we are 80% or 88% now um, renewable electricity here in New Zealand as well. So we are doing things, we are taking steps, we are, um, we do have some, some new initiatives in place to encourage the uptake of electric vehicles, um, just through the budget 2022 that's just been announced, 2.9 billion New Zealand dollars has gone into climate action. And we've also seen just two weeks ago, the emissions reduction plan announced in New Zealand, which an independent body of scientists uh, and interested parties, including uh, Indigenous community, were able to contribute to in setting New Zealand's emissions budgets for the next 30 years. So we are, we are taking steps here in New Zealand, and I'm sure you are too, and I've heard about some of those tonight, and it's amazing to hear the progress that is being made across both of our nations and also across the world. But I think we still have a long way to go. It's, it's really hopeful, though, that we are on this journey, we're taking steps in the right direction, and that we can take leadership from each other in different ways and learnings from each other. I've learned a lot just from listening to your answers about some of those challenges uh, that you're facing, and, and that also is encouraging for me, but also heartbreaking. It makes me realize, too, that we cannot take advantage of the positions that we are able to get ourselves in as young people in countries where it's easier to be at the decision making table that that is uh, a big privilege and a big responsibility that we carry to um, to to try and make it easier for people like yourselves as well through the narrative of what a politician looks like and sounds like starting to change people people told me I could never be a politician right, because I'm an, I was an 18 year old girl who hadn't gone to university and who didn't, as some people said, had the, have the knowledge uh, to be in this role. But I believe that, um, that you panelists have, have really shown that, uh, you know, we need to be, we need to be at these tables, that you've got the knowledge, you've got the understanding. So I would encourage you uh, to continue finding ways, even if they're small ways, to, to chip away at the current political process, but also at the current uh, mandate of people to bring together as many as you can to show that um, there's a strong mandate for, for strong, ambitious climate action. So yes, New Zealand is doing some great things that I think we should be proud of and that other countries should take leadership from. But we all have we all have a way to go and yeah we just need to support each other through I think uh, I'm a part of an amazing network called the Intergenerational Climate Ambassadors in New Zealand and we're doing the same thing as coming together across academics youth scientists artists and all of our different politicians in all of our different ways and saying it doesn't matter which political party we support it doesn't matter which medium we choose to get our message out with, 
what matters is that we care about this planet. We care about the future that we're creating. We care about ensuring sustainability and ambitious climate action. Come and join us. Let's unite behind those, behind those really clear and, and simple messages. Uh, and yes, so New Zealand, that's a, probably a long way of saying uh, that, that I'm, I'm happy with where New Zealand's at, but I'm not complacent. And I'm trying to be excited about the possibility and not disillusioned by the reality at times, because yes, it can be tough, uh, even having our voice heard here, but I would just send you so much strength and courage and know that us young people in New Zealand are right here alongside you. We're always willing to, to talk, to share knowledge, to share understanding, uh, to support with tactics that we might have used and that we might have found helpful, because we all need to be, we all need to be sharing. And we all need to be, yeah, reaching out across across boundaries, uh, across borders, and doing what we can to support one another. So, oh, I admire you so much for the work that you're doing, and I know we'll continue to do. Yeah. Thank you very much. While we are speaking, we. In the Korean background, we have shared many challenges we have experienced so far, and the discussant have been in the environmental activism, and they have faced a lot of challenges, but it, that is very native to Korea. And we have made improve a little bit, but still we believe there is much room to improve. So we feel a little sorry for that. We have make a little tweak in the politics or policy size, but we still have a lot of things to do. So instead of being encouraged, they are more likely to be discouraged. So they just share something. Uh, they feel a little sorry for that. So some people saying that the positive side, some are saying that you made it, you have made progress, but some others saying that you uh, you failed it because there are many more rooms for them to improve. So why don't you just share your personal experiences? I think Mr. O have such kind of experiences a lot because climate crisis and COVID-19 and consequent the economic failure. Many are saying that we have to make more investment in economic growth, but that is not growth, a green economic growth, but we are just going back to the existing way of economic growth. So he is just strongly resistant to that, and he made his own movement. He just stopped uh, uh, the extra and additional investment into the coal power plant, and he have a very specific cases and experiences. So please share that with us. You said some discouragement, but instead of that, the history of climate action here in Korea is pretty short. So the NGOs got together in 2019, we uh, the, we got together to form a emergency group. And for the first time in September of 2019, we mobilized about 6,000 for the strike. And since then, many other the groups have joined us. Many, not only the youth group, but also many other civic group joined us to took the street and to make some direct movement and that have been built in the past three years. Well, the changes we have made in Korea, I am not sure if the former government of Moon Jae-in administration made announcement of the net zero, because of the that was the international the movement or he is really uh, encouraged by his own policy i'm not sure about that and i, I also do not sure if that have a big impact on the the public uh, to be honest with you i don't think so of course that was a great trigger to boost up all the narratives about natural and we can gather and garner 
see as much actions as possible based on that. But the possibilities of a political changes, we are kind of in the way to make the changes in the political landscape before the climate action. So we can expand the horizons and possibility and areas of that climate action in politics, and we can uh, build up the scale of it. And we have to be alert. And we shouldn't make uh, the campaign of compromise. When we are discussing with the government or company, we shouldn't focus on how many opportunity we have secured so far. We always talk about it's the crisis of our existence and we are facing our the risk of the existence, but still we are emitting the GHG gas. If we are asking the question, we still know that, but because of the, our interest and the vested rights, we just have a short-sighted perspective and choose the status quo. So to, to break that, we have to mobilize more people to fight against it. I think that this is a high time to do that. Well, I echo with you a lot. How, if we clearly understand how serious the climate crisis is, then the thing we can do is very clear and obvious. We have solutions out there and it's kind of affordable and doable and possible to do that. But still we do not choose opt for that. Is it because we don't understand climate crisis? And so if we raise the awareness of the current level of the climate crisis, then I believe that many more people would opt for acting out for the climate crisis. So that's one of the concerns that I'm having. And, and on the other hand, the way we resist just against the existing system, do we need to have some new system as an alternative to the existing system? Or we can just encourage people to do some certain act or behavior. Well, some are saying that if we are resisting too aggressively, then that may bring up some the counter effect but the, the encouraging people means compromising with the current situation reality. So some are saying that we have to be more aggressive while others are saying that we can make a balance between the two. So there are mixed scenes are going on because of that that have not translated into effective message to the public. So Sophie, have you ever shared this kind of you know, thoughts or concerns before? Then you can just share your experience with us. Yeah, thank you. That's very similar to the kind of concerns actually that I, I have shared and that I often kind of ask myself that question of yeah what's it what is it going to take and some of the things that kind of I've I've noticed in in the journey around kind of getting to the political table and then trying to use that space to create real difference for our planet has been that I've seen a lot of politicians and people generally in the general public kind of living in their own silos and not looking across to their wider community or uh, understanding their responsibility to the collective, not understanding too that our impacts now, as I mentioned earlier, are already having a huge impact on those who are at the front, on the front lines of rising sea levels, of increased severe weather events, of like more intense droughts and flood events. There are people who, who are, you know, starving at the hands of continued increased greenhouse gas emissions and so again I think one of the real challenges is that people um, this is a huge generalization but we see still a lot of people living in their own silos and an inability to look wider to 
to the community, to the global community, and an understanding that we're citizens of, of this one collective earth uh, that we share. One of the other things I think, as you've mentioned, is that the awareness as to how climate change is affecting the planet now is not super widespread. There's an understanding that climate change is a future issue. It's something that we're trying to mitigate now so that we don't have to, to see it in the future and we don't have to be in a world where the climate crisis is raging all around us. The reality is that there are already increasing wildfires in Australia, right next door to New Zealand. We uh, in 2020, at the beginning of 2020, our whole sky, even in New Zealand, was was red and grey by the smoke from the Australian bushfires. And that's just a, a kind of small example of, of the global community and, um, yeah, how, how real the impacts are now. So I truly think that there's, there's a real lack of awareness as to just how pressing the issue is in this moment in time. It's not just a future issue. And, and as was mentioned too by discussants that because of that it's not just an issue which will affect young people it's an issue that will affect those who are 50 60 years old in this moment in time as well um, but in saying that there is a big stake that young people have and whether there is action or not too another challenge I've noticed is a prioritization of profit and power over what's right and that introduces a kind of moral challenge where yeah, there will be personalities and people who just have a real hunger for having control and having power. Um, but ultimately, what good is that power if it's not put to use in a way uh, that actually creates meaningful change? And it's it's a real hard thing for, for people's mindset, again, to be changed around. But yeah, that's a real challenge I've noticed is some people's kind of greed and hunger to be in a specific position just so they can feel the power and feel yeah feel powerful um, but we need to make sure that there's some sort of accountability for people to use that power to to achieve good and to achieve yeah positive outcomes in terms of the climate crisis we need to change I think to what we value and whose perspective we value in the conversation we can't just value one kind of stock standard perspective when there are so many others out there who who aren't currently being heard in this discussion who we really need to um to bring in and yeah youth voice is one of those uh, so we need to change yeah how and who we value when we have these discussions and we need to collaborate I don't think it needs to be um I don't think it needs to be an us and them I don't think it needs to be I don't think it needs to get kind of super heated obviously it it has the potential to because you're we're talking about really revolutionizing some industries changing some industries potentially removing some industries from our economies but when we can actually get around a table and talk about those things in a way that's open and honest and collaborative I believe that's when we kind of find a middle ground and find and build that bridge over to a future that that we will feel proud to pass on. So I think there needs to be far more emphasis on how we collaborate and how we bring, again, our, our, our differing contexts and differing landscapes to the same table to be honest about the challenges. We're not gonna get anywhere if we continue to brush under the rug the real challenges that we're facing. We need to be open and honest about those challenges uh, and yeah, find, find ways to just chip away at at addressing them um, through whatever means we might have available to us. But I think that starts with being open and honest about what we're finding challenging in our plight to, yeah, to achieve climate justice. Thank you for the comment. So as Sophie said, we need this kind of discussion more and not many people, there are many people who do not know about this kind of discussion and we have to promote that further. 
and we need a national discussion, but we need a much more smaller scale discussions at the regional level and at the community level. So it could start at the grassroots level, but we could achieve collaboration at a much higher level with the time. And how can we organize uh, this kind of discussion more? And how can we find ways for collaboration with more stakeholders? That's a challenge we have now. So um, it has been an interesting discussion. So time has flied. I didn't know that. But we only have 10 minutes left. So if you have something to say, and if you have urgent message you want to deliver, it's time for to, for you to do it. So our panelists, do you have any uh, comment you want to add to the discussion? So Ms. Hyun, you can start. So I was interested in climate crisis, but uh, my interest was gone. And later, starting uh, with a big wave, I started to become interested in climate crisis once again. So there has been ups and downs for me. And there are various social issues. And depending on majors and uh, industries people work in, they have different interests. And sometimes they are overwhelmed by their daily lives. So it is hard for them to have interest in other social issues, such as climate crisis, for example. However, still, if people only focus on their job instead of a climate crisis, can we call them bad people? That's not the case. So these days, people value their jobs and people have their own values. Then how can you connect those individual values to climate crisis so that they can have interest in climate issues? That's my interest these days. So activists always say that we, in order to protect something we value, we need to maintain sustainability of the planet. We always say that. However, we need to be more persuasive in delivering the message so that we can have more people interested in climate crisis. And I would like to think about the strategy for the future. That's my comment. So before, there was this question. So you said that uh, we can have a discussion by removing politics. So I believe that the role of activist is to make the movement, which is irresistible to the public. So there are issues we cannot have a clear answer right away. And there are like-minded people around us. And our goal should be mobilizing more people who have the same ideas with us. And we shouldn't drive ourselves based on criticizing others. But instead, we have to focus on like-minded people and we have to focus on collaboration with them. So instead of only focusing on the result itself, we have to start talking to people next to us. That's how we can reach hopes. And that's the direction we have to take. So I thought about what I will talk about in the discussion and some lyrics came to my head. I love hip hop music, and this is a song of Tupac, and the title is Changes. And in the interlude, the lyrics are, so it is English, so it is easy to understand. 
let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. And let's change the way we treat each other. You see, the, the old way wasn't working. So it's on us to do what we got to do to survive. 라고 이런 가사인데. 그러니까 이건 어쨌든 투팍이 말했던 거는 약간. So it was the lyrics. So it was about uh, the community of African Americans. However, it is relevant for climate crisis. So whether and what, no matter what kind of a social movement, in response to such a social challenges, we need a comprehensive approach, not only the system, we have to start with our daily lives. That's the first step. So how can we make changes? That was the question I have asked myself. And we have to share vision. And we have to take baby steps toward the vision. And I think that's the biggest drive for the movement. And lastly, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation. And I would like to share my experience and in this discussion with others around me. And I hope that you would achieve something big. Uh, so I root for the younger generation. So I, I expected a longer comment from panelists, but they gave me uh, shorter comments. So I felt we are connected, although it is a virtual conference. So I feel that we are sitting next to Sophie today. So you have thought about uh, various uh, aspects of the issues. So Sophie, do you have any uh, last comment you want to share with us? or to the Korean public or Korean audience. Wow, just to say again, a huge thank you for the opportunity to join you and to be a part of this conversation and to sit alongside you. It very much feels like the distance is not as far as it actually is because we have to be uh, with each other virtually. But I would just like to respond to some of the comments made by panelists around how we connect kind of people's values together and also connect then those values to uh, people taking action on the climate crisis. I think we need to create space for people to take those positive steps. So yes, we need to begin uh, to some degree with people taking steps in their own lives, but the system has to enable people to do that. Uh, and it also has to support people to do that in a way that allows them to feel kind of proud of being better custodians of the planet. So if, if there are ways that we can support people to take those small steps and allow them to feel, to feel proud and to talk with others about the small steps that they are taking, I don't think we can underestimate the power of that. I would say too, just to, to round us off, is that we obviously are aware that, and, and those of us who might be listening in, and I know our panelists are very much aware of just how serious and severe this crisis is now, but also aware of how big of an opportunity this presents us to act in this window of time that we have. And ultimately, if we don't, then we let this moment slip by and we let our opportunity to be on the right side of history slip by too. We also let the opportunity slip by to create an economy which is going to be resilient to the challenges, but also able to tackle these challenges head on. We, we completely let that opportunity slip by. And so I would say if we're up for having the discussion, if we're up for collaborating, as was mentioned, let's just talk to everyone that we can, have the conversations about what it means to be a citizen of this planet, what responsibility then looks like, back to ensuring that we have a planet to, to pass on to the generations that follow. And I think once we truly kind of start to do that and break down the conversation to one which is quite simple and, and just one that, that does look to the future. We know we are in a crisis right now. We know the extent of the challenge, but we also know we have everything in our power to turn this around. And so the conversation now has to be, has to be about doing that. And it has to be about pulling every lever, whether it's in the political realm, 
out mobilizing on the streets. And again, I would just like to acknowledge the incredible work of, of young Korean activists who are doing who are, who are doing so much in, in bringing this to the forefront of the discussion. And so a huge congratulations and well done and further encouragement and support from me to you uh, as you do that. And I'm always here to, um, to offer support and uh, encouragement wherever I can. But to say that all of that is valuable and all of that needs to happen and it can just start from a, from a conversation. So take any learnings or anything that you might have gotten away from this and talk with someone about it. You might not agree, but you will, you will find a place in which you are able to have a discussion about our collective future. And ultimately, if we can, if we can start to orient the conversation towards that and ensuring that young people are at the table, ensuring our planet has a voice in decision making, I think we will be getting to a better place. Our leaders need to be accountable to that. They need to be accountable to the fact that this planet is the foundation of everything. Um, and, and that's something that Indigenous communities know and uh, is part of their, their foundational knowledge and understanding. And it's upon all of us as, as custodians of this land, as people who are borrowing it from the generation before us and who will pass it on uh, to do everything we can. And it can just start from a conversation. So I would say, just get out there and take take that baby step um, because it does count and it may lead to transformation. Chase that transformation and get excited about the possibilities that come with a climate just world. Thank you very much. And we this brings us to the conclusion of today's colloquium. I truly believe we are connected. I feel we are connected. So after today, we can just to keep, we can go back to our place and just to keep working for the target that we set out. And I, at the same time, I hope we can have many more time to have this kind of discussion. I direct a report with the one part that I found in an article, climate crisis is putting everything that we are having at risk, the living things. This is a critical moment to, to all the organism and living things. And I want to wait until others are taking some actions. I want to do something for that. I, I want to do, I, am, I believe that we have a power to turn that into a, something beautiful. So I am doing everything in power. I totally echo with it, not only me, but all the participants. So we can keep working for that big, uh, you know, the cause. So this is the end. And you said that you are getting recovered from COVID-19, but still, you, if, even though you are don't feeling good, but you are taking part in and being suggested, thank you very much. And my special thanks goes to all the discussants and participants. Thank you very much. <laughs>